In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's showtime! And my guest today said that if I don't let him remake Beetlejuice, he is going insane and he is taking me with him! Kevin Mosteller is back! How you doing? Now, Kevin, is Beetlejuice a movie that has been, will be, or should be remade? It has not yet, but we are going to today. But should it be? Should it be? Oh, that's a or tough one. Or will it be regardless? Will it? It will be regardless at some point. Yeah. And it's a classic. It's a tough one. Because it's, it's I, a modern classic. I kind of categorize this under the will be, but not the should be. Exactly. Like, yeah. It I don't will think be. this movie should be remade. I don't think it'll work quite as well. No, especially in today's climate, if they're trying to, you know, play the old, well, we can hit all four quadrants with it, it won't work. So, in addition to watching the movie, my friend Caitlin, who I watched the movie with, she owns it on Mm Blu-ray, and one of the things that they include on the Blu-ray are a couple episodes of the animated TV show. Yes. I watched the animated TV show long before I ever saw the movie. I saw the movie for the first time like a year ago. Oh, really? Okay. And... But growing up, I watched the cartoon all the time. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and watched an episode. I was like, oh, this will be a fun throwback. No. It's so bad. They're they're rough. That was actually my introduction to Beetlejuice as well. Oh, yeah. Um, Was I saw the cartoon first, Saturday morning cartoons. Yep. And then my my dad was like, oh, maybe we should go check out the movie too. And there was a vast difference there. (laughs) (laughs) It's Uh, very different. Yeah, yeah. The show show's kind of a mess. Uh, it is. I will say that I like like the her whole enchantment thing to summon Beetlejuice or to summon herself to where Beetlejuice is. It, I think it yeah, goes both ways. It does, uh, and I like. I actually, for me, it captured my young imagination to have that. Like, there's a whole another nether world out there that <laughs> it's weird and spooky. Weird and yeah, well, they have weird cow skull friends and yep, weird cars with. <laughs> With bulls on that the car is so strange. I had that toy when I was a kid, man. The... I loved that thing. So the premise of the episode I watched was the car's been kidnapped. Like Beetlejuice sees, just sees the car like driving away, so someone stole the car. Mm. So Beetlejuice becomes Sherlock Juice or Beetle Holmes or whatever he is. Right. I kind of remember that one. And they like they're tracking down the car, trying to figure out what's going on, and it's just not nah, the car. I just went to watch a movie. <laughs> that's it that's the entire thing and i'm just like ah yeah yeah i I can't remember the exact premise but there was also one where that was like an indiana jones episode and oh, he was I'm like sure. he was grindiana bones it was really all oh. i remember about it and he was going uh <laughs> they were in search of some MacGuffin somewhere and i will say that the people who were doing like the voices like i don't know who that voice actor was who was doing beetlejuice but he wasn't doing a bad job no no they were it, great yeah and i mean the cartoon of Catherine o'hara is just Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so talking about the movie, you, your dad took you to go see this? Uh, my dad took it home from the video store. Sure, this was what what, like 89. It had already come and gone. And like I did watch the premiere of the Saturday morning cartoon when it, when it first came out. I remember being super excited for it, not knowing what anything about it other than that <laughs> ghost show looked cool. But yeah, I was like five, five or six. And the, the cartoon was kind of the, the intro. And uh, spent many Halloween since being Beetlejuice as a kid. <laughs> I mean, it's a good evocative costume that he doesn't wear for actually all that much. No, no. He's in it for third act of the movie and that's it. But... Yeah. But you enjoyed the movie when you first saw it. Oh, yeah. yeah it's a blast. Because you, your dad brings home this movie and you're just like, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. It is. Yeah. And then and then you go back to the show and you're like, but wait, where's the part where he's, you know, swearing and smoking and kicking the tree down? <laughs> like, <laughs> That that was some the one thing in the movie where we paused it, rewound it, and was like, "Did he just say fuck?" Yeah, and we're just like, I, dude, "Did he? Let's what, he couldn't have." This movie is rated type type type. Look look look, PG. <laughs> it couldn't be. Yeah. Wait 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 wait, and it's PG after Temple of Doom, so PG thirteen exists already. Right. And so we go, we rewind a little bit. He kicks over the tree and he goes, "Nice fucking tree." And we're like, 
He did. He said it. Yeah, nice. It's nice fucking model. Oh yes, thank you. And then the the foley that goes along with it when he grabs his crotch. I mean, the, that would have yeah. gotten uh-huh. you. I would have gotten you an R right there now. Yeah, it honestly <laughs> would have. Yeah. I don't know. Different time, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of all I can say about the like. Um, I dove into this weird PG thirteen, like how it came about versus yeah. what it is now to sell toys. Well, yeah, now now it's it's a tool to hit all four quadrants, right? You can take your little kids, you can take your parents, yeah. you know, you can take your grandparents. But then it was like, you know, just this this isn't quite R, but it's not quite for little kids. There was some video I watched that talked about how it was created specifically for Temple of Doom because Temple of Doom would have been given an R, but they wanted to bring it back so that kids could watch it so they could sell the kids' toys. It was it was actually because of because of Temple of Doom and Gremlins. Oh, and Gremlins. Yeah, and Ooh. they were both too. I mean, there was a moment when they like throw the gremlin in the microwave and it explodes everywhere, and that that really that's gross. upset parents. Yeah, that that really upset yeah. parents. Um, and I think. Uh, I only know this because it came out on the day I was born. The first PG-13 movie is Red Dawn, starring Patrick Swayze. Wolverines. Yeah, Wolverines. I've never seen it. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you ain't missing The soundtrack kicks ass. All right. <laughs> All right. I mean, I believe that. Yeah. That's fun. So then, of all the movies you could have picked, we were talking a little bit about this before we started recording... What are the two movies you've talked about? You've talked about uh, Monster Squad and... Uh, 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 my uh, Fellow Americans. My Fellow Americans. Yeah. I was like picturing the presidents because i just this week did the hey, throwback <laughs> thursday my fellow americans yeah and this so i guess monster squad kind of fits your genre of being bit. the horror guy yeah but this kind of gets closer much closer yeah it's definitely got some scares in it if you're sure. you know a little a little sensitive but it's also i i live in the dark comedy it's, horror I, I love that stuff and this one to me is just it was almost like my gateway into it in a weird way because Absolutely. because it it start like it started from I was this little innocent kid and Beetlejuice corrupted me. <laughs> <Like>. <laughs> He's doing his job. Yeah, pretty much. But this movie's kind of perfect for me because it has this like weird stylized gross weirdness mm-hmm. but with no tension, no thriller aspect like it doesn't really have the jump scares that really get me. Like I right. can look at weird stuff like the moment when uh, Alec Baldwin and Genus Davis are like weirdly stretching their faces to make themselves into monsters. Right. That's hysterical to me. Oh, it is. Yeah, I love that. And just the the people who, uh, like, work in the office because they committed suicide, like the flattened guy. Yes, the the world building in this this movie is just, God, it's it's beautiful. Like, uh, uh, walking into a waiting room when you're dead, I mean, that's kind of, it kind of takes the fear out of, everybody's mortal you know fears of dying right like it kind of it's like there there is this other place and look that guy died choking on a chicken bone (laughs) that one set himself on fire smoking in bed like as long as you're not exercised everything's gonna be okay yeah everything's or eaten by a sandworm i guess uh yeah apparently that well no because in the he get eaten by a sandworm and he wound up right back in the waiting room so it's true i guess that just it it takes you back to round one kind of i guess (laughs) and gina davis like rode in on the sandworm yeah yeah i guess she's a big fan of dune yeah so what would you say so i'm sorry i kind of skipped over this but why beetlejuice what what makes this the movie you want to talk about uh it's actually it is one of my favorite movies it's to me like we talked about what should be or will be remade i don't i think it's a perfect movie and i don't think it ever should be remade um it's kind of a just a guilty pleasure from childhood. I loved every aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, not every aspect of it. There are some things it. that don't hold up. That's yeah, true. Yeah, and some actors that could have been, you know, not used. But that's okay. Oh, I don't know about any of that. I, I, oh. don't nec- I don't necessarily know anything bad about any of the actors. Really? I don't. Tell me. Jeffrey Jones? Who was he? Jeffrey Jones was Charles Dietz. Oh, the dad. The dad's, yeah. What did he do? He is like a major, major, major pedophile. Oh um, no! Yeah, he this th- it came out in like two thousand and three, I think that he was like distributing ch- child. Damn. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, and his career has been over since, rightfully so. Good, rightfully absolutely. so. 
he was not a good person. No. And I, 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 I look at the movie now and I, like, that's all I can think when I see him. And I hate that because I actually really love this movie. Right. The, the writing is so much fun. Like the, the world building and everything around it. So of, speaking of the writing, I don't know the answer to this. I suppose I could have looked it up, but I didn't think about it until just now. How much of Michael Keaton's performance is improvised? That I don't know, actually. That would, that would be a good one to look up. I do know that, of course, Beetlejuice was kind of supposed to be just the the walking id, right? He right. was just kind of like this uncorked, like, I don't know, a ghost that figured out if he could do anything he wanted, this Why is not? what he'd be doing, right? Like That said, my big change that I would make to this movie is the world building in this movie is amazing. There's the sandworms, there's the waiting room, there's all of that. Right. There are some limitations there in that, like, oh, you're number nine million something, 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 and they're on number three, but there's only four people in the waiting room. Right. And, like, you can certainly expand that with, like, better technology or whatever. Well, but my issue is, honestly, a little bit of the... I somehow felt like there was too much lore. It could, it could be a bit streamlined, but I still don't know how much of it... I mean, it does kind of get confusing at certain points of, like, why why does it... Take the three names to, you know, saying his name three times to call him. And why does home, home, home get them home, right? Right. Like, things like that. There are a lot of a lot of moments that, yeah, the, the waiting room works for me. If you've ever called Social Security or, yes. or any kind of government agency. Yeah. I have for sure had to get a Social Security card replaced. <laughs> yeah. That's... Uh, the internet is saying it is a largely improvised role. Oh, I believe it. Because, man, he's just... Right. Excellent in it. So the things that like I spent time on, because these are the things I normally love in movies that I like. I like focusing in on mm-hmm. is when they have their original social worker. She's like, "Well, he used to be my assistant," mm-hmm. and then she feels very modern, and he talks about how, "Well, I was living through the Black Plague, and oh man, I had a great time then." Yeah. Well, I'm. And that is a plot hole, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, or unless it's it's not necessarily a plot hole. She just dressed modern, more modern, and obviously he's dressed modern as well. Like they're updating with the times. Yeah. But they also talk about like how he has to marry someone in order to escape. It didn't feel like he was trapped anywhere. Yeah, that part kind of has always been a little confusing as to why that was the thing that he had to. And I know the line like I'm like an I'm like a illegal alien or whatever. I have mm-hmm. to get hitched in order to to get free but i'm still not quite sure what he was trying to get free from so here's my pitch okay i would like it if he's this crazy guy who likes being able to do all these shenanigans but it it's all about being able to do bigger and worse things and Mm -hmm. he's it's not i think we should take out the marrying a child thing yeah yeah I, i think it's to the point where he scares them to death like, the the rule according to the, the manual for the recently deceased is you can scare them, but you can't kill them. Right. We got too many dead people down here as it is. Leave them alive as long as you can. Just scare them out of there. Beetlejuice is trying to scare people to death because the more people he scares to death, like, he ups his own ranks. And he wants to become a full-blown oh. demon. He doesn't okay. want to be a ghost anymore. He wants to... He, he wants <laughs> I'm to... I'm going to quote Jafar and say, why be an all-powerful sorcerer? But I could be a genie or whatever. I'm yeah. paraphrasing. No, I get it. I get it. I saw, I saw the new live action when I was on the plane from Montreal. It's not good. I've heard that. Mm-hmm. I've heard that. I saw the uh, the Prince Ali number. That's all I saw of it. And boy, I'd never seen anybody phone anything in like that before. <laughs> I actually don't feel like Will Smith was phoning it in. I think that he was just trying for a different take because Robin Williams is so manic and everything. Yeah. yeah. But Robin Williams is giving it his full energy into the performance which and will smith felt like he was holding back and i feel like that's the problem with those performances oh okay i mean yeah i could see that definitely to me it just felt like he was phoning it in but yeah in comparison to like a Mm gene robin williams that's i mean talk about things that shouldn't have been remade that's right that one absolutely should not have like i was talking about this a little bit yesterday like that's a remake that actively diminished the original for me yeah because all of a sudden 
I'm less engaged in this movie, so all of a sudden I'm thinking about things while watching this movie that I never would have thought about while watching the original. And that, I mean, just to go back to what we were just talking about, that's how I feel about seeing Absolutely. Jeffrey Jones and Beetlejuice. Yeah. Of like, oh man, now I have the, there's this creepy thing. That's... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, you don't want you don't want that layer of disconnect. You want to be fully engaged. Right. Like so, for the the example I gave was all of a sudden Aladdin shows up and takes her on the magic carpet ride mm-hmm. and he starts singing, "I can show you the world," and I'm like, how? You ain't, you ain't seen shit, kid. <laughs> that is very true. What you're, do you know what things are? kid. You, yeah. How do you know you what, don't what the world know. is? I get that like she's like a caged bird and you're going to let her fly. But, but also, a, you don't know. It's almost like taking a princess to a palace and being like, I can show you the world. And then her going like, yeah, I live here. It's <laughs> I've got maps. Yeah. Do you know where you're going? The carpet does. Does it? Because it's been in a cave for a really long time. (laughs) It it was little things like that that I was just like, oh, no. (laughs) But. Well, some things work in cartoons that just don't work in live action. That's the thing. And and now, like, I'm hesitant to go back and watch the cartoon because I'll be like, oh, no, I'm already thinking about these things. Now I see this major plot hole. (laughs) So, but for Beetlejuice, like, I feel like if you were to try to remake it now, you would run into some of those things. Like, why do we have to say his name three times? Oh, he's yeah. trying to turn himself into an incantation. Sure, uh, that works perfectly for me. Actually, I, that that makes more sense, and it gives it just enough. Because I mean, the thing with horror is you kind of have to walk this fine line of mm-hmm. like, if I give it too much, the monster's not scary. If I give it too little, the monster doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. So there's like that fine line that you kind of have to watch. And I know this is like an like an extreme example, but Halloween, the original Halloween. Michael Myers, you don't know anything about him other than he was an escaped mental patient who killed his sister 30 years ago. And that's enough. That Yeah. That's enough. Uh, I, but I feel like with Beetlejuice, it kind of got a little mired in its own its own lore, if mm-hmm. you will. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, you just, as a kid, you watch it and you just kind of accept these things because it's, it's cool. And you're mm-hmm. just going along with the ride. But, like, yeah. Saying the name three times as an incantation is great. Um, I also feel like the the kind of Highlander, the reverse Highlander, if you will, of like, if, yeah, if I scare enough people to death, I get their right. whatever, their soul, their id, whatever, and I elevate myself to become this ultimate demon. But at the same time, that might, I'm just, I'm walking myself in a circle in my head. That might make him less lovable. Well, I feel like... This, I mean, because this is very much the horror comedy. Mm-hmm. Like, even when I'm on IMDb Pro, horror isn't here. It's comedy fantasy. Oh, really? Yeah. That's fascinating. So, it's, I feel like what makes it the horror is the Tim Burton of it all and their ghosts. But yeah. I wouldn't necessarily describe this as horror either because we meet the monster right away. That's true. That is true. If you want to make this more Michael Myers-y, like, because we get the, the assistant who I did not recast because I don't care about her at all. The assistant. The, the, the their caseworker. Oh, the caseworker? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she comes in and goes, oh, he was my, he was, he was my assistant. I keep saying assistant to describe her. She's the yeah. caseworker. He was her assistant. Right. And it would be like, we get this ad from Beatles. Just don't trust it. Why? We don't know his, we don't know what's going on. We don't know his deal. They don't know when he died. They have no records of this guy. Somehow he's, has all the powers of this ghost, but he doesn't know when things went on. I would love it if they're not even sure if he's dead. Right. But he's been around long enough that he must be dead, but they can't prove it. And they just don't know right they're just not sure what he is Mm -hmm. just kind of been lurking he's always kind of been there yeah and that to me is and and he's always almost like almost like an invisible evil like jaws of like there's always gonna be sharks in the ocean like he's always there that lurking kind of we don't know if he's a demon we don't know if he's a ghost we don't Mm -hmm. know what he is but He's been there since yeah. I've been here, and that's... <laughs> I would say, like, ooh, and here's how we can tie it into later in the movie. We can say the only thing we know about him is that he somehow got a copy of the manual for the recently deceased. hmm And whether he was alive or dead when he got it, they don't know. But that's what he's learning to do everything, and that's why it's so bad that the kid and uh, Otho get it. Yeah, because they can they turn can, into the next Beetlejuice. Exactly, they can they can kind of almost weirdly join his him and become like a weird cult or something. Yeah, like, you know, and he can even do that. Like you, you're alive. You've read the book. Help me. We can do this thing together. That's that's even better than marrying. <laughs> that's much better than marrying. Because she doesn't because she doesn't like her mother, right? right? So if he gets 
uh, Lydia to come in and scare her stepmom to death, yeah. she can have all of the powers that he has. Yeah. And then there's our there's our uh, Beetlejuice want exactly, and as a result of that, she almost gets cold. She gets gets cold feet last minute of yeah. like I, I am. It, it hits her like a bucket of water. Like I'm asking to kill my mom, it's right. like my stepmom. She sucks, but the result is mm-hmm. not something that I want. But she have. did cut my sandwich into into the shape of a ghost, so I guess <laughs> I can't kill her. Yeah, she's that would still, actually be, that yeah. would actually be a really sweet moment. Yeah, it like would be. the mom because the mom. Like, everyone kind of does creepy stuff. Like, the only weird, non-weird one are, like, Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis and yeah. then the dad. Because he just... Well, and even he's kind of obsessed with, like, real estate or whatever. Yeah. He's he's an 80s guy. He's yeah. out to make money. Like, and that's... <laughs> right, basically. And the mom, like, makes weird, creepy art. And then the art attacks because it's weird and creepy. Yeah. And, like, Lydia should be, like, kind of drawn to, like... Eventually, I feel like they can bond over, like, clearly these are two weirdos. Yeah, you would think... But I I also have always taken the position with her of, like, because their stepmom, like, Lydia immediately doesn't like stepmom no matter right. what she does. She could be the weirdest, creepiest Morticia to ever walk the planet and try, but she's not mom, right? Yeah. She's, and I feel she's like Beetlejuice usurper. can really lean into that. Exactly. And and kind of play that that psychological angle with her. And I think that's that's a much better cool. story. I like that. Than, uh, than Beetlejuice wants company. Exactly. He wants... Well, I need an assistant. An intern. Yeah. All I'm saying is I keep you around for a couple of centuries and then boom, you can be your own Beetlejuice is what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll teach you the ropes, kid. You can name yourself after whatever star you want. <laughs> <laughs> because the title of the movie, Beetle Juice, is not his name. No, it's not. It's it's a, it's, it's a star, right? Yeah. It is? It's the star that Ford Prefect is from in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Is it pronounced Beetle Juice? Or, or Betel Juice? Betel Geist or Betelgeuse something? Betel or something like that. Huh. Everyone pronounces it Beetle Juice? Probably because of this movie. <laughs> Honestly, that might be true. Yeah. And it, it was... Interesting for me because I don't know if I caught that because the last time I watched the movie was like oh yeah whatever and then we watch this movie and it's easier to read it as Beetlejuice yeah but even in the credits he's credited as like Betelgeist or whatever yeah. yeah and I thought that was super weird well I think that was a marketing thing I think they were gonna release it probably as release it as that and then people are gonna be like what the hell <laughs> but they they must have picked it because it sounds like Beetlejuice right and they're like yeah yeah it sounds like Beetlejuice. So why don't we just so why don't call we just call it, it Beetlejuice? Beetlejuice, yeah. Well, because it's not the name. Who cares? It, it, it's not going to look good on a poster, guys. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what do you want? Something unpronounceable, or do you want people to literally read the words Beetle and Juice? Yeah, put it together. Good point, marketing together. person. Hey, that's why we pay you the big bucks hey. over at Warner Brothers. Is this a Warner Brothers movie? <laughs> it is a Warner Brothers movie. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> so then, what do you like? What do you dislike about the Alec Baldwin Gina Davis character? Ah, uh, I mean, they're pretty likable characters to be, to begin with. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like they're designed that way. They are absolutely by design. I think they're a little too small towny, little too small towny. There, there wasn't as much character development there as like ah, he owns a hardware store and she's a stay-at-home wife. They make some sort of reference to the fact that she can't have kids. Yeah. Yeah. Which I feel like is in there because, oh, and then Lydia comes around and this get, Lydia gets to be the kid they always wanted. Yeah, it is. It's very which clearly, yeah. But I don't care about. No, it's kind of subtle at the top. It's, it's a little too subtle at the top is what and I'm saying. And also unnecessary. Like, yeah. Well, I feel like I, I get what they were trying to do with the, the bonding of the... Sure. But it does get a little creepy at the end where she's like, I want to be with her. And it's like... Well, why? There wasn't enough there. So at the yeah. end, after they pull their faces apart, they're about to walk back into the realm with these weird, elongated faces. She turns to Adam and goes, I don't want to do this. I, it, I'm paraphrasing. I don't want to do this. I, I I like Lydia. I want to be with Lydia. And those those are the exact words. I want to be with Lydia. And I was that bumped for me. And I was kind of like, but why? Yeah. Like, w- there hasn't been enough interaction there for you two to have that bond. And also, I mean, I they did kind of a passage of time because they completely remodeled the house. So yeah. presumably they were living together for some months. Right, right. And there, well, there's that, I, I don't know if, if you've ever heard this theory, but there is a theory that time is only in this realm, 
right? Like time as we know it linearly only operates that way in this realm. Right. So it's kind of fun for them to like, yeah, we just wandered around this office for like a couple hours and we come back and it's like six months later. Yeah. <laughs> So I actually really enjoyed that aspect, but at the same time, they weren't there for those whole six months, right? Right. Like, so there couldn't have been any any bonding. But for people who are redoing and redecorating the house, a house that they just bought, well, the upstairs room is locked. Yeah. We own this house. Unlock Knock the door. Knock it down. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would have done. I would. Yeah. That's what. Eventually, you take it off the hinges. Everyone would do. Right. Haunted or not. Haunted or not. <laughs> Crazy key or not. Exactly. Eventually, you take it off the hinges. And, yeah, it's you know, a door. It's a door. You'll be fine. Yeah. It would be funnier if they... So, they make a door. They use the chalk. Mm-hmm. They draw a door. They make it into a door. It'd be right. funny if they then drew bricks onto the door and turned it into a brick wall. Oh, that's kind of fun. That's actually really fun. Do the reverse. They're kind of, uh, almost in a way, finding their... their ethereal powers if you will right they're they're learning how to scare people that's what the book is about it's about finding and learning your powers to an extent yes then like beetlejuice takes advantage and and goes too far with those powers beetlejuice is just uncorked like completely out of control almost in a weird way yeah manic energy crazy fun if it feels good do it right right that's that's pretty much how i feel about him anyway but I think we could take it to the next level for him and scaring people to death is fun. Yeah. And almost like kind of wanting to corrupt Lydia in a way of like, let me show you how fun this is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then we can see the whole scene where she drops the dad. Yeah. And and only she's in on it. And maybe that's what makes her feel guilty. It's like, no, not him. And he's like, why not? Look how fun this is, right? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it also could be possible that she enjoys it. And then just like mm. he takes it too far at like eventually. Right. Like it's all fun when the, when it's just, when no one's getting badly hurt. But like yeah. once it reaches a certain point, you kind of back up and you're like, okay. Someone broke their arm. Yeah. That's yeah. not, Yeah. They break the one thing the mom really, really liked. Like, all of a sure. sudden, wouldn't it be funny if she can't do art anymore? I'm going to break her fingers. Yeah. That's the, that's that's not the funny. one thing she likes. Why would you do that? Yeah, exactly. Well, just look how tormented she is. That's hilarious, yeah. right? And that's that could be the turning point for her where she kind of, you know, maybe we maybe we send the first, have the first part of the second act of her kind of doing these these shenanigans with uh, <laughs> with Beetlejuice and and that's what takes it too far. And yeah. her turning point can be because the, honestly, the part of the cartoon I like is I like this little girl hanging out with this crazy demon and them yeah. finding friendship. Yeah, and it actually, I mean, I really enjoyed that kind of they. They it's Lilo and Stitch. Lot. Yeah, we want to do Lilo and Stitch. Is what we're except saying. with a ghost that kills people. Yeah, you and know. find and uh, Stitch finds Lilo, and then Lilo eventually says, "You know what, Stitch? I think I've had enough. Exactly. I'm gonna go hang out with these cool ghosts who who know where to draw the line. But at the same in time, shock. And now, yes, they wear designer bed sheets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in in this version, you can't put Beetlejuice back. You can't take him. Right? No, because so it's, now it's. Yeah. And also, now then that becomes the problem. Right, because right? it's not about putting Beetlejuice back. I mean, I get that like, you summon Beetlejuice because Beetlejuice is trying to turn into a demon. Like, you summon the demon, right. you've summoned the demon. Exactly. But the when, job has to be done. But once the fun is over, it'll of, she'll, of course, just do the kid thing of, like, I'm done with this. Yeah. And then we have to deal with the repercussions. And actually, we can also use it where uh, Lydia was bonding with Adam and Barbara... But then they're going and wandering this office for six months. Yeah. And so she's trying to keep having fun, trying to keep having fun, and, no, and the ghosts aren't there anymore. So she turns but to the next... But she finds the card. Right. Like, they throw the card away because they're like, we're right, you're right, we won't call this uh, this lunatic. And they throw the card away, but Lydia finds it because they're not there. And so she summons uh, Beetlejuice, and Beetlejuice is like, you want to have fun? Let's have fun. Oh, you, I'll show you fun. It's showtime. It's showtime. Yeah, basically. That would work for me. Absolutely, yeah. That definitely cleans up some of the problems. That, <laughs> yeah. but that's kind of like our main story, Adam. Uh, that I'm sorry, that's our main like Lydia Beetlejuice story. Sure. The what I was kind of leaning towards when we went off down the Beetlejuice road because Beetlejuice is more fun anyway. Yeah. Was when I was talking about Adam and Barbara because it's basically it's these small town folk and mm-hmm. then the big city folk come in and like try to big city up this small town place. Right. And that's 
still current. Yes, that is uh, that is quite happening quite a bit all over the country. Still. And I mean, there's two people of color in this entire movie. Yeah. And one of them is a lady who doesn't talk, and one of them is a guy who. Well, one of them is a lady who barely talks, and one of them is a guy who is at the end and does not talk. One of the things that I did was I actually didn't end up doing this intentionally, but it just kind of happened that way, that I, I made it a much more racially diverse cast because I don't necessarily want it to be seen as the, oh, here's the people coming to teach these white people a lesson. Right. I want it to be like, well, it's these are the small town folk and the big city folk, and that's, there's nothing inherently wrong about either position. They're just people who live different lifestyles but can still learn to cohabitate and, in fact, become friends. Right, right. And so that's kind of, like, we have kind of our main storyline of our Lydia Beetlejuice, like, becoming a demon story. Mm-hmm. I feel like our kind of, like, undertone social stuff should be message about... Gentrification, a little essentially. Bit, yeah. yeah. And while gentrification is something that happens, it's not... it. The gentrification should not replace... Right. But it can be in addition to. Exactly. And then I feel like that's a good... I, I, it almost kind of does already hit that because at yeah. the end, if you look, they're they're getting their house back to the way it was. And they are. But that said, aside from the interior, the interior was crazy pants bananas. But the exterior yeah. of the house, I thought was really cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I liked the design on the exterior of the yeah. house. The and like when they have this like weird little offshoot patio and they're looking up at their house, I'd have turned it around so they were looking out at the town. Well, but. <laughs> Like, they kind of, like, have this design for a really cool-looking house that was absolutely a blend of the modern and the classical, and I loved that. Yeah, I thought that was, I thought the exterior of the house was really, really cool and postmodern, and uh, almost reminded me of something up in the in, in the hills yeah, of L.A. Like absolutely. Interior garbage. Needs was, to be, we can, we can do better, but. It was very 1988, let's put it that way. <laughs> it, was, it was very Tim Burton. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah, very 1988, Tim Yes, Burton. fair, true. In the middle. I'll give that to you. Tim Burton now. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> we need more colors. Yes. Can you get a different shade of that mauve? Anyway, forgive me. Is that a real uh, thing? Yeah. It's not a real thing. Oh, okay. I was going to say, like, it'd be really great if there's, like, a, a Tim Burton quote is, can you get a different shade of that mauve? It should be. I mean, it, if you watch Dark Shadows, I'm sure he said something close to that. I'm sure. I'm not going to watch that movie. That's okay. It, I, I saw it on a plane, so that's the yeah, only fair. <laughs> uh, I was like, this looks mildly entertaining, and if it's a complete disaster, well. <laughs> <laughs> you're on a plane. That's, yeah. the t- that's the time to watch movies that you're, you're on the fence about. Yeah, exactly. The, so what else do we need to talk about in terms of like plot and construction of the movie? Um, I mean, the, th- the third act is still kind of a mess. Um, I like the idea of them being summoned into, uh, and but the, the logic behind Accidentally them... Accidentally exercised? Yeah. Because he was trying to summon them, not exercise yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. And then, like, literally the whole point of that was summon them, oh, I guess we're exercising them now. Yeah, oops. Yeah, the I mean, the, the marriage thing we kind of covered, but I feel like... The, oh, back to that. She summons Beetlejuice, and then Beetlejuice saves Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis, and then Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis stop Beetlejuice. That never made any sense to me. Why would Beetlejuice have saved them? Yeah. It makes more sense if that would have been something Lydia would have done, because Lydia uses her, like, she's getting these ghost demon powers on her own by working with Beetlejuice. Sure. Lydia saves them. Just a separate thought from me. No, that's that's not a bad one. Um, I know it was like the deal that she made, so it was supposed to be kind of like the deal with the devil. Ah, uh, uh, he he was like, look, I'll, I'll, yeah, I can help him, but you know, I'm, I think the words are like, I'm kind of like an illegal alien. If I want to get out of here, I gotta get married. And I don't, I still don't know what getting out of here means. Yeah, I'm not sure what it meant either, other than he was just kind of. I don't know, walking am- among us? I guess. Uh, I'm not sure. Or not He stuck wanted in to the... be fully seen all the time. Because they talk about how, like, human beings can't really see yeah. ghosts unless they're... Attuned to it or whatever. I, my, I myself am strange and unusual. Right. The, and I feel like Beetlejuice wants, just wants to be always visible all the time. Because I feel like Beetlejuice's greatest fear is being ignored. Yeah, yeah. That could even be almost how they stop him in the end mm-hmm. is he's just like if that's his biggest fear and he just kind of turns into a tantrum child of like look at me look at me yeah. look at me look at me and they take his power away by ignoring him i mean mm-hmm. that's actually 
the end of Nightmare on Elm Street too. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that I think about it, yeah. They, I mean, like, Beetlejuice already has kind of like the break the fourth wall aspect to it. Like, yeah. no, do not Nightmare on Elm Street me. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Actually, it's kind of funny. You you can't ignore me. You can't take my power away like I'm. This Freddy. isn't a dream. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, that's kind of fun. And then, like, all of a sudden, his uh, uh, vertical stripes get turned into horizontal stripes. It's like, I'm not even wearing the shirt. Oh, wait, I am. But I'm not normally. <laughs> Here, let like, me take off this hand claw. Almost like battling it. It's... <laughs> Basically. Turning red and green stripes instead uh, of black and white. Now I want that. Yeah, I know. I... It's just like the ignoring is kind of like turning uh, his power against him. I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna get all technical, New Line is owned by Warner Brothers. We can do we it. We can do it. Yeah. All right, good. All I right. like that that's how Beetlejuice is defeated. That's very funny. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's a good bit. By pop culture references. Yeah. Um, yeah, essentially. I mean... How else would you defeat him? That, I assume that's how Deadpool's defeated. Yeah, probably. I don't know the answer, but if it were me, that's how I would do I it. I don't either, but it probably lies in like a deep cut episode of Friends or something. Like yeah. So, yeah. It, the one where Deadpool was defeated. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> 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 oh no i hate the end of the deadpool saga cut the... to camera i hate this one <laughs> uh joey in this episode's hysterical though <laughs> but yeah i think that's kind of the movie yeah that's kind of it's i definitely oh here's my mm. other thing what do we do about the true villain and murderer of this movie the true villain and murderer yes the dog the dog um well they do. They they sacrifice themselves to save the little doggy. Yeah. You know. I mean. I mean. Yeah. It is they a, don't a, sacrifice themselves to save the little dog. The dog totally screws. Totally. Them. Totally screws the pooch on that. One. Yeah. Hey. There you go. <laughs> the way I think they would do it now is like you cut to this thing and you show the dog walking down the street and then the dog turn like turns, winks the camera, turns back into Beetlejuice, turns back into a dog, keeps walking. Oh. But I hate that. And yeah. I think that's dumb. And I think it's funnier if it's just chance and happenstance. Yeah. I think it still needs to be some random thing that, that kills the dog. An accident. And we make fun of the whole save the cat thing. It's, <laughs> oh, it's, kill the I dog. Th- I think, no, no. I think it's funny if by saving the cat, they die. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. I do agree with that. Because that's literally what happens in this movie. It is. It is. And uh, I, although I don't know if we need the part where the dog is like... Standing on the standing board. Standing on the board. I don't know if that's that necessary. That was a little bit silly. Yeah. And well, I mean, also the ravine that they fell in, nobody's going to die no. in that. That's... <laughs> that. They'll be fine. Yeah. They, they, unless they had a seatbelt malfunction, they're, yeah. you know... But I mean, in that in that ravine, come on, well, they they could have <laughs> yeah. very easily swam out of the window. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that would have worked is like the car flips over, and then like something from the bridge it's falls the, onto the car, yeah. hits it just right, the car explodes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it would have to be like the right car. We're talking like maybe he's a restored a Ford Pinto yeah, or something. Exactly. And <laughs> it's like it's like my uh, and if, it, if it's anything like my old Gremlin, it'll light up the night sky. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Something. It needs yeah. to be, I feel like it needs to be something ridiculous and over the top. Because yeah. their death is somewhat mundane. It is. It is. And it's... Honestly, Tim Burton could have done more. I agree with that. I mean, I know I know Tim Burton could have done more. But at that point, he was... I mean, just in terms of examining everything, he was kind of going by the book, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, know, it's a good trying act to play one nice. yeah. building up towards. Right, right. So, I mean... All right, that's fine. I'm okay with a mundane death, but I do think it's funny if by saving the cat they die. Oh yeah, I completely agree with that. Whatever. It, it, it could even be, be no. It needs to be like a literal black cat just to go full symbolism of black cat runs in front of them and they save the cat and yeah. die. I mean, it could literally be like uh, they're them. they're trying to feed this like cat that like keeps walking around the. Honestly, it could be a, a cat that they like. Opening scene, they're establishing, oh, we're nice people. There's a stray cat that they put some food outside for. Sure. Cat eats it, walks down. Sure. And then they walk around and they're getting stuff from the hardware store. And like, oh, the cat's in the middle of the road. Uh, I'm going to go grab it. No, no, honey. It, the, it, the, it's a cat. It'll be fine. It, what, if, what if it claws you? No, no. It's in the middle of the road. What if it gets hurt? It won't get hurt. It'll be fine. All right. Well, I'm going to go get it. Honey, no. Come back here. Bus. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that, or cat saving, pulling the cat out of the tree, and the branch breaks, and then they yeah. they plummet to their yeah. doom. They land a box of fireworks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How, who built this firework factory under this tree? <laughs> yeah, it's just a, the wily coyote. Uh oh, sign. <laughs> 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 
just a smoke cloud. Just, just, just a smoke circle slowly yeah. rising. <laughs> they there's a painted t- uh, there's a wall with a painted tunnel on it. And they just drive right into it. Oh man. <laughs> You really have to hit that home. It's uh, that's the path to the house. <laughs> <laughs> the cat continues up the road. I mean, honestly, if it's owned by Warner Brothers, we, we could have go full cartoon. Beetlejuice yeah. take the form of Roadrunner. Meet me runs away. They run into a wall. Yeah, that's true. It could crash right into the wall. But then that that leads to him setting up this entire elaborate plot. And unless you pay that off in the end, it's not. Gonna, I know it's, it's just not going to work. It's, it's it's just but it's if, absolutely uh, yeah. yeah. Or just like Beetlejuice or orders like an uh, Acme's box of mega scares. <laughs> yeah, what have we got here? We've got a uh, uh, snakes in a can. That's interesting. Opens it. Real snakes. Real fly snakes. Out. Uh, That's a blast. Actually, that you can have yeah, so much. We've fun got. With it's that. a blast. Yeah. It's a. It's a, it's a jack in the box, but when you open it, it just explodes. Yeah. Yeah. I got some real good ones. I love these guys. Those are great. Buck 50, the entire box. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drawing a Going out of business, but the important thing is, I love them. <laughs> All right. So that's our general plot. So do you want to get into uh, the casting? Yeah, sure. Unless there's anything else you wanted to talk about in this movie. Because, like, what's what's the essence of Beetlejuice at the end of the day? I the Of uh, the character of the movie. The movie. The I, I think it's a lot of fun with the afterlife and i mean like we talked about it's also kind of a weird metaphor for gentrification kind of like and looking so, looking at it now so do you think we've covered um, it? i think we've covered i think we've covered the message of the afterlife as well i, I think we're i think we're we're close Great. there there are things that you know just wanted to make sure we were covered on the movie you love oh yeah i think so all right well it, it has its holes now yes. <laughs> now that i'm a fully functioning adult but... yeah and, and every I have no movie is going to stand up to perfect scrutiny. No. There's nothing that no. can. No. We're going to end up nitpicking stuff. But at the end of the day, if people sit down in this movie and they and just sit down and they love it and they watch it and they love watch it over and over and over again, then it's a good movie that deserves to be the box office success that it was. <laughs> yes. That spawned a, a bizarre cartoon. It's uh, so weird. But, it is. So yeah. So I think we're in good shape. Let's talk about stuff. Sure. Do you want to start with Beetlejuice or do you want to build to Beetlejuice? Ooh, yeah, well, I'm perfectly happy to start with uh, Adam and Barbara. I was gonna say, why don't we start with them and build the Beetlejuice because he is kind of the the star of the show. Yeah, I mean, even though he's in it for what, like 20 minutes. <laughs> what did they say? Uh, Michael Keaton was only on set for three days for the filming of this. Oh, that I didn't know. Yeah, it's something like that. I believe it though. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of makeup for the time. It is. It is. That's a good three hours in the makeup chair. Yep. So. And a lot of things can be doubled up on. Like they're just on like the weird. That said, the, the the set design of this is fantastic. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of the claymation in it is it's pretty, pretty spectacular. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I know you could probably do better with CG, but there is a hell of a charm. I'm to... always a fan of, for stuff like this, doing practical as much as possible and exactly. blending in CG. Agreed. It's like, I would show the waiting room of, like, here are the six people we can clearly see sitting here who are very practical. Yeah. And if we turn slightly, we can see more and more and more and Everyone more and else more in the more background. People. Yeah. Millions of people stretching out as far as the eye can see, and that we get CG. Yeah. That would be my pitch. Yeah, no. Like, I, like I, I said, as much be... as possible. Exactly. Obviously, this has, I guess, the claymation of the giant worm, but. Right. And yeah, there was a few other moments that were like the the, the snake, snake, and then the end of the fireplace was yeah. kind of was claiming. I mean, it was an interesting choice if you think about it at the time. It was, it was and very. There, and I I think it worked well. Yeah, I agree. So then, who do you have for your Adam? So for my Adam, Adam and Barbara, A and do B. You, do you want to do both? Hold on. Wait, time? wait, wait. Right, so right. the two the couples are Adam, Barbara, Charles, and Delia. Yes. A, B, C, and D. Oh wow! I didn't. I have never put that together. I'm just figuring that out now. <laughs> and then we get Lydia, who's L. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, she just doesn't follow the pattern. Yeah, she's a, she's an outsider. Yep. You know, Sorry. So who okay. do you have for Adam? So for Adam, I went with Sam Richardson. So Sam Richardson, he his big claim to fame right now is Veep. I know you've seen his name. He's an yes. old buddy of mine. Very, very funny comedian. Can be a very, very good straight man. Definitely holds his own with with some some big stars. He's a pretty funny dude and knows his knows how to play strengths and weaknesses. Great, so, love it. Um, one of the best improvisers I've ever met. Dude's, Ooh, dude's a lot of fun. That's good for um, this movie. Yeah. I kind of cast in that same vein a little bit. I went with Kumail Nanjiani. Okay. But yeah. I... And everyone kind of knows who Kumail Nanjiani is. Yeah. 
And he kind of like plays the, he often plays kind of the dweeby guy. Sure. But you might be right. I think going with Sam Richardson's probably the, the better choice. Okay. Because Camille Nanjiani might be a little bit too recognizable right now. And I'd rather have a Sam Richardson. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I think he'd be, he'd be perfect for this kind of button down. He's not, I guess Adam's not stuffy, but he is just kind of a nerd. What was weird for me like, was that when did, so this movie came out in 1988. Yes. How old you, Alec No, no, no. Was? You oh. know what movie also came out in 1988 and What's I recently that? discussed on this podcast? What's that? Working Girl. Ah, yes. With Harrison Ford. Which Alec Baldwin is also in, playing almost the exact opposite kind of dude. That's right. He is in that. So, wow. like, in Beetlejuice, the horror movie, he's kind of playing, like, the, <laughs> the well char- put together, the nice guy, the charming guy, just yeah. the... Yeah. The guy you bring home the mom. Yeah, exactly. And then in Working Girl, he's the, hey, I'm just this he's, guy over here. And that one, he's the 80s guy. Yeah, it's, oh man, he really is. Um, and it's just funny that those two movies came out in the same year, and they're wildly different. They are, absolutely. And I mean, I guess that's a testament to his versatility, right? Yeah. He's I mean, very funny, and then you have movies like Malice, where he's sitting there going, I am God. You think I have a God complex? Never seen that one? No. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> movie reference to movies people have never seen. <laughs> I mean, Malice is a good name for a movie. Yeah. I guess. I don't know if it matches what the movie's about, but... Doesn't I mean, matter. I mean, he's great in it. Yeah, yeah. I know. Who, who cares? Right. So Sam Richardson for Adam. So then let me tell you about my Barbara. Okay. My Barbara is Rashida Jones. Oh, that's really good, actually. Because she also... Can, I. You could totally see her yeah. being modern day Gina Davis. Like she can kind Absolutely. of play like the the just whatever housewife, whatever, but she also is goofy and fun and like did you ever watch Angie Tribeca at all? No, I haven't actually seen that. I what I like plowed through the first season of that, and it is just this weird comedy. Mm-hmm. And she can give it's just like such dry delivery and like she's a producer on a lot of different things, and I just think mm-hmm. she's incredibly capable and highly talented. And I'd like to see more with Rashida Jones. No, I agree completely, one hundred percent with you. Um, my my pick was Mary Beth Monroe, who was Alice in Workaholics. Oh, okay. Can can do really well with kind of the sweet, but also when when it's time to to uh, leap into action, she's she's got quite gusto, quite the gusto. But I think I think for this, Rashida Jones is probably the better choice. Cool. Just. Personally, that. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I really think that she was perfect for that. And I for think Barbara. Sam Richardson and Rashida Jones could be like a good uh, idealized small town couple. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's yeah. adorable. I think it's adorable too. So then, did you cast uh, Jane the realtor? I mean, I kind of went for the ob- I didn't cast her, cast her, but I was like, wow, well, the the obvious is you know kind of like going for Melissa McCarthy or something. I also went for the obvious and did Molly Shannon. Oh, oh yeah, Molly Shannon would be great for that too. Yeah, she's kind of like the the was, were they sisters? Ma- I don't think so. I felt like, but there's that sister energy there of like, oh come on, this house is too big for you. Which like, who else would say that to you unless you're a because sister? Because you're not gonna have kids, right? Like that, and, but like also. They died, so why would she get the right to sell the house? Yeah, that, that's a that's an even and better if, like, question. It only, <laughs> and like, if the only living relative was this sister who wanted to sell the house anyway, then there you go. Then yeah. There you go. But I actually, there is no calling out in in the movie of like, oh, it's my sister in law, or it's Adam's sister, or you know, whatever. Yeah, like that. They just like, oh God, it's Jane. Hide. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure Melissa McCarthy and Molly Shannon would. Either or. Either or. It's yeah. fine. Let's go with Molly Shannon because she's great. Cool. Melissa McCarthy's great too, but, you know. I mean, I... Don't see a lot of Molly Shannon I honestly anymore. considered Melissa McCarthy briefly for Beetlejuice. So did I, actually. And I'm at the point where I'm ready to talk about Beetlejuice. Oh, are you? Unless you'd prefer to do Delia, Charles, and Lydia first. Uh, we can. All right. We can do then, those too. Uh, then we'll come back to Beetlejuice. All right. But, like, I think part of what makes Beetlejuice interesting is Beetlejuice needs the manic energy. Like I agree with that. You, like, you need the craziness. Yes. Which is why I think we'll probably end up having cast the same person. But we'll come back to that. Okay. So since we're going A, B, C, D, who do you have for Charles, the dad? Uh, for Charles, I had chosen a guy who's kind of a little more smooth-talking than oh, interesting. Jeremy Jones was originally. But I think he fits in this kind of, like, real estate developer needing a break from the big city so i went with walter goggins uh walton goggins walton goggins did i say walter jeez 
Ugh, get out. Yeah, whoops. Sorry, Sonic guy. changed his name so he could join the union or something. Sorry, guy. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> Which I think he did. Pro- oh, oh, really? I think so. Oh, I can That's, see uh, that. Uh, who's the guy who plays the Green Goblin, Goblin in Spider-Man? Why can't I think of his name? The new one? Or no, no. The Franco? Original. No. James Franco? No, no. Uh, the first one. It's oh, it's um, Willem Dafoe. Yeah, because I think his name right. is William, but he's Willem because of uh, union stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm pretty sure that's um, true. Although, I don't know that Walton Goggins changed his name. That might be his name, but I don't, I, I don't know that. I don't know that either. I do know Michael Keaton is actually Michael Douglas. I heard that, but I didn't remember it. Yeah, that's true. It's always yeah. good. <laughs> um, I went for a little bit of a different energy for the dad. I kind of okay. went with the more like inept, stereotypical like sitcom dad. Mm-hmm. And I okay. cast someone who created his own sitcom. Um, oh. Because I was specifically looking for, like, comedy people. Uh-huh. And so for this dad, I there's an actor named Steve Byrne. Oh, I don't know Steve Byrne. He was the creator of the TV show Sullivan and Son. I have not seen that show. And specifically no, because the Lydia I cast is Japanese. I needed uh, ah, a parent okay. to be of Asian descent as well. And so that's why I found Steve Byrne. Let me see if I can... He's someone that when I saw him, I recognized him. But I didn't strictly, like, go... Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. So anyway, so, like, he... Steve Byrne is... Whoop, he's most well-known for, like, having created the show uh, Sullivan and Son and just, like, other interesting things. Sure. He's a stand-up who's kind of, like, a periphery of, like, almost ready to break through. I don't know how well Sullivan and Son did. I... I think I watched an episode of being like, oh, this is fun. And then I, I never watched it yeah, again. I had actually never heard of it. So I mean, maybe I have my head in. I was hoping I didn't have my head in the sand. And you it, didn't. Uh, I just don't think it was very well marketed or published. I, I think it was cute, but not groundbreaking. I see. But that, so that's part of the reason why I cast him. I, partly because I was looking for someone who could be a parent for uh, the little girl I have for Lydia. Okay. Do you want to, do you want to just go for Lydia then? I or? mean, let, we can certainly talk about Lydia's. Okay. And again, I'm not a proponent like, they've got to be the same race. I don't care. Right. I'm perfectly happy going with whomever. Well, I mean, it also kind of ties into the story if she's adopted as well. Yeah. You, you know, it could kind Absolutely. of like, because she's already got one step parent. Yeah, there's nothing Foster wrong with her parents would two. also be, yeah. a, you know. That's certainly true. Indicative of her character, if you will. The actress I have for Lydia is a little girl who's been in American Horror Story. Okay. Are You Afraid of the Dark? The Darkest Minds. Oh. She is an actress named Maya Czech. Huh. Oh, yeah. I have seen her before. Um, I do. She's in the new Rim of the World movie, right? Oh. Uh, oh, no, wait. I'm confusing it. Oh, no, she is in it. Okay. She is in that Rim of the World on Netflix, which is actually a really fun, uh, weird, more of a... F- Com- funny stranger things ish it's like the premise is a bunch of kids go to camp and then the alien invasion happens so it's a dark comedy so is it, yeah yeah crazy well, i weird. mean yeah how'd you know it was, <laughs> uh it was kind of fun but yeah that's where i've seen it from i actually don't watch american horror story i kind of found it was eh, it kind of bored me so nothing wrong with that yeah so uh, sorry guys <laughs> no, you're a monster oh uh, so tell me who you had for Lydia. So for my Lydia, I thought uh, I cast Maya Hawk. Actually, tell me, who, um, tell me about Maya. Uh, Maya, tell me about Maya Hawk. Maya Hawk is the daughter of Uma Thurman and Ethan Hawk, and she her breakthrough was in Stranger Things. Okay. This last season, mm-hmm. but her energy is just really fun, and yeah. I think I thought in terms of like a goth kid who's kind of quirky. Like she hasn't already been. Given some pointers from the person who played Lydia originally, whose name I'm forgetting. Winona Ryder. Winona yes. Ryder. Thank yeah. you. And I figure, I feel like at this point, she could be in the same shoes that Winona Ryder was in 1988. Where I could totally see that. Kind of coming up, and uh, yeah. she could very easily play a, a bratty goth chick. And I think her energy would, would match, kind of, both be equally repulsed and want to go along for the ride for who I chose as Beetlejuice. Of course. And I agree that she probably would be great. I have one issue with the casting of this particular actress. What's that? Do you know how old she is? No, I don't, actually. She's 21. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Well. And casting her as, like, the 12, 13-year-old wouldn't necessarily work as well for me. Sure. I've got nothing against this actress, I don't watch Stranger Things, but yeah. everything I know about her and everything everyone has said about her 
yourself included just now, is that she is fantastic. Right. I I just think that she's about eight, nine years too old. Oh, I agree. I So I didn't look into how old she was. Uh, I just saw her on Stranger Things, and she played a high school age teenager pretty great. Yeah. Uh, she did a pretty great job. So that's kind of yeah, she's the direction a, she's a good I was going. 18 to look younger. Yeah. The problem is that she's an 18 to look younger, and she's not... Like, like a 12, 13 year old. Got it. Which, uh, Maya, Ch- uh, Maya Check, let me, she's 12. Oh. And that's why. I that's more of a, yeah. okay. So, that's fair. Again, nothing against your choice. No, no. However. Yeah. In terms of the character, that's what we need, right? Yeah. So, we can go with, with Maya Check. Sorry. But that's not a guarantee that we will then go with Steve Byrne. Tell me right. the name of your, uh, Charles again. Walton Goggins. Oh, yeah, Walton Goggins. We very met, uh, very, well, may end up going with Walton Goggins. Sure. Let's pick the best couple or the p- pair of people together. It might be your right. dad, my mom, my mom, sure. dad. Mom might go with the dad. Yeah, yeah, dad yeah, yeah, might yeah. go with the mom. Right. Who um, knows? So then... Cats and dogs living together. <laughs> Who did you have for uh, Delia? Uh, for D. So in terms of um, trying to match Catherine O'Hara, who is, like, again, this this goes with one that's shouldn't be remade because she's just... She's so good. A gem in this movie. She's amazingly great. Her performance is fantastic. She's so offbeat and wonderful and amazing. Yeah, and and quirky and just... The only person who I thought could kind of maybe fill those shoes was Kristen Wiig. Because she's I equally yeah. kind of crazy and quirky and can do that. A role like that. Absolutely. I also had a similar time recasting her just because she's so fantastic. And Kristen Wiig's an excellent choice. Yeah. I went with Wendy McLendon Covey. Oh, yeah. The mom mm-hmm. from The Goldberg. She's on Reno 911. Yep. Strong mom energy, but like she's the kind of she's the breakout star of the Goldberg just because insane. she's able to do like cra- that crazy weird shit. Yeah, yeah. No, and she's great. She's 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 another gem. So what I would like to do is let's put Wendy McClendon Covey with Walton Goggins. I would be... Because yeah. that's a funny pairing because you very much Absolutely. have like the Walton Goggins, like Wall Street, like... Kind of buttoned up, one yeah, yeah. wheeling and dealing. And... I wouldn't describe him as buttoned up, but yes. Well, I mean... For, they have for... very different energy and you're yes. just sitting there looking at them going, how did this happen? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I do, I really do think Wendy... I'm going to butcher her name. I'm sorry. We'll say it again, Wendy. I'm already butchering her, na- butchering her name. When- Wendy McLendon Covey. McLendon Covey, yes. She definitely has that kind of crazy, yeah. also, I mean, mom vibes, but also insane. But she's also insane. for sure insane. Yeah, and and that's, I think, what this role needs. Yeah. Um, especially because now it's going to be, no, I guess it still could be she's stepmom, right? If, if Walton Goggins was previously in a marriage with somebody else who could have produced Maya Check. Um, not her. But uh, uh, yes, yes, thank you. And again, um, I'm also perfectly happy with them both being step parents. I got sure. nothing against that. Yeah, same. And uh, I think that's a lovely idea. Foster parents would damage somebody enough to get to a demon. Exactly. Right? I mean, and you adopt this little girl, and all of a sudden she comes in wearing like a, a, a spider web oh, veil. Yeah, <laughs> spider web veil. Which. So my friend who I watch this with is a costume designer, and we were just like talking about like the costume design on this, and it was just like Lydia's was always on point. Oh yeah, yeah, it's it so was good. so good. Yeah, drawing a lot from Robert Smith, I think. Yes. <laughs> but man, yeah, hers... it was just great. Yeah. Which, so the only other character I have cast in addition to Beetlejuice is Otho. Okay. So let's talk about Otho, and then do you have anyone else besides that? I thought it would be fun to do some of the like little cameos cool. as I'm well. I'm looking forward to hearing all of those, but let's it's talk fine. about Otho first. Let's talk about it. You went first for Delia. So Otho, I kind of did a one for one. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing about Otho is that uh, Otho's, that actor is really only known for two movies. Yes. Beetlejuice and... Demolition Man. Thank you, Demolition Man. Yeah. Both of which are movies that have now been discussed on Ideal Remake. Oh! And our episode three is Demolition Man. I didn't know that. Yeah. I have to dig a little deeper into your catalog. Yes. I love Demolition Man. And I really like what we came up with for Demolition Man. Yeah. But the like that episode in particular is super fun. And so I was kind of doing a little bit of a one-for-one, like kind of looking mm-hmm. for someone who had sort of the same energy. Mm-hmm. And while I think for the guy who was playing Otho, this is very much his genuine energy. Yes. For Eric Stone Street, I think it's a little bit put on. Okay. 
But because he's really only known for his betrayal in Modern Family, right, right. And I think he's very good, and he and Agreed. apparently he's a nice guy. When I first got to LA, during the first year and a half I was living in LA, I did background mm-hmm. work. Okay. And one of the shows I did a lot of background work, like kind of like in the background a lot for, was Bones, which oh, was all right. on the Fox lot and yes. was super fun. And they were really nice to us. And I remember one time we got we were broken for lunch, and I was leaving for lunch, and I remember seeing Eric Stone Street walk in. Because his parents were visiting, and they really wanted to see the Bones set because they watched Bones. Really? Because Modern Family filmed in the Fox lot as well. Right. And he was just... And so I literally walked up, and he, and he, like, he said to me, how do I get on set? I was like, oh, just go around the corner. And he'd be like, oh, I was like, oh, great, thank you. So my interaction with him is very limited. But like the fact that he was like taking his parents around and showing them the set for this show that they enjoy, I just thought was super cute. Yeah, it's very sweet. So, That's nice very guy. sweet. That's all I had about him. And yeah. again, you really know for the one thing, but... That's okay. I actually was borderline casting Eric Stone Street because I love him. Mm-hmm. Who I, did you go with though? So I also I did one. Who was better? My one for one in energy, in kind of manic big guy energy. I I actually I went with Nathan Lane for oh, Otho. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's uh, kind of the obvious. Right. I think like they the actor who was playing Otho. Who I should look up this guy's name because it's bad that I'm not saying. His yeah, name. I used to know it. Um, unfortunately, he's passed on. Yeah, that he, I know. He was so good. I think he was in a couple episodes of Tales from the Crypt too, if I remember correctly. But he was a he was a really really great recognizable person. The minute you saw him, you're like, oh, it's Otho. <laughs> Glenn Shadix. Yes, that's it. Glenn Shadix. I feel like he often got cast in these movies because Nathan Lane wasn't available or something. I think that's what I because I think Demolition Man especially. I think it was written for Nathan Lane and then Nathan Lane wasn't available. Or was something. Nathan Lane a name then in 1993? I didn't. I, don't I wasn't remember, aware but of him. I think Nathan Lane's been around for a while. Yeah, I wasn't aware of him until Some, I, Mouse I, Hunt. I also was, just might be wrong. Yeah. Oh yeah, apparently he did voices for a lot of different things as well. Yes, he did. Wait, yeah. who's he in Teen Titans? He was the brain and Monsieur Mala. Oh, <laughs> Glenn Shaddix, you just became so much cooler in my eyes. Oh man, I didn't know that either. He's known for like he's best known for Beetlejuice, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Heather's, and Planet of the Apes. That's right. He was uh, he was in Heather's. I do remember that. And then uh, he was the mayor, right? In in Night Before Nightmare Before Christmas. I, think I almost so. said Nightmare on Elm Street again. <laughs> so Glenn Shaddix was born in 1952. Nathan mm-hmm. Lane was born in 1956. He's only four years younger. Okay. Which I don't necessarily have anything wrong with that. I think Nathan Lane is good casting for this. And obviously Nathan Lane is very good in most... But th- like He's probably yeah. best well known for being in The Producers. But like right. also his role in The Birdcage is oh, yeah. iconic. Yeah, I actually... The Birdcage is one of my favorite movies. It's yeah. hilarious. That's a movie That's that I honestly like. don't think I can ever do on this podcast. Because I think it's... Im- it's I think it's actually impossible to remake that movie i agree with that 100 percent. because if you didn't have those people yeah in those roles it would not have worked it's just too good it was yeah uh, that that is probably close to a perfect movie yeah i agree with that i'm perfectly happy to go with nathan lane that's very much the same energy so yeah i'm in the same boat of like i'm i'd actually prefer to go with eric stone street to be honest with you well let's see as of this moment i've gotten four you've gotten two so let's go with nathan lane all right, that's fine. That's fair. But I no, just... both are great. Yeah, they are. They're both equally great. I was just thinking in terms of like, well, if he's not as well known, let's give him a shot in our in our remake. Yeah. But... I Modern Family is very popular. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, he, but he's not. Yeah. And, well, Nathan Lane is kind of not as popular anymore either. So. So then let's talk about Beetlejuice. All right, let's talk about Beetlejuice. So here's the thing about the way I cast Beetlejuice and kind of the way I envision Beetlejuice, Uh where I think there needs to be mystery around who Beetlejuice is. Same like, we don't know when Beetlejuice died, we don't know who Beetlejuice was, we don't know anything about it. It's just this this person who showed up and like started being crazy and somehow had the book and we don't don't even know if Beetlejuice is dead. That's alive, whatever. Yeah, Yeah. possessed. Right. Sure. So... I would have loved, but I also think like that manic energy is incredibly important. Mm-hmm. I agree. So I was trying really hard to find like a, a gender non-binary or gender fluid performer mm. to play that because that way okay. it isn't necessarily male or female. It's just Beetlejuice. Sure. So the thing is, while there are a number of amazing gender non-binary performers to varying levels of professionalism and talent, like... 
Ray, Ray Butcher's very good, but she mm-hmm. certainly doesn't have the manic energy. Mm-hmm. There's a YouTuber named Caitlin Alexander who's good, but very, like, not... A, probably not well-known enough to be Beetlejuice. Sure. And also doesn't have the manic energy. And I think, well, Cara Delevingne is very pretty. I just don't think she has the skill in, in order to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would need to see her in something good first, because the two movies I've seen her in, her performance has not necessarily been up to snuff. I see. But again, everything of, everything outside of those I've seen of her, she's very interesting and very compelling. Mm-hmm. And so I'd love to have some of these performers, they just don't have kind of the manic energy to do that. And I'd love to do like the whole nationwide search, find the right person kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Uh. But at the end of the day, probably the right person for the role is Kate McKinnon. Okay, I could see that. I was actually on the fence with her as Beetlejuice as well. Because yeah. again, Melissa McCarthy, Kate McKinnon... Yeah. crazy energy mm-hmm. improviser willing to do insane things spectacular i actually went in the opposite direction and it wasn't quite one for one but i was looking at a, at somebody who was a guy who was a bit misogynist quit as beetlejuice is i mean he's going going towards the whorehouse at one point and that is how they distract beetlejuice yes yeah yeah exactly and he he is really you know, kind of just as a this person, or how, or how we no no characters. Beetlejuice the character. No, no, Beetlejuice is Beetlejuice yes. is absolutely misogynistic. Yes, yes, and that's and what that's I mean. That's how he is portrayed. I would say part of the reason why I was kind of shying away from that and why I kind of wanted to go a different casting direction mm-hmm. is because I don't think we should have that kind of Beetlejuice in this movie. I see. Well, that's what I was saying. I went for that, and I felt uh, in terms of being un- an uncorked id, like Danny McBride is is yeah, that. That's but if we don't want to go well, in that, that direction. Said, my understanding is that Danny McBride is a lovely human being. Oh, he is. These are the sorts of characters that Danny McBride plays. It excels at playing. Yeah, and that, and that's excellent casting, by the way. In terms of in terms of going with, would be the next level of Michael Keaton today. Right. It would be Danny McBride. Probably. And, and of course, Danny McBride is is a very. You know, I've met him a few times. He's a very nice guy. He is not anything like any of his characters, but he plays those characters really well. I'm going to pause real quick and say, if you can hear people screaming in the background, it's because there are people using the pool on this lovely Sunday afternoon, and we can hear them through the window. Sorry, keep going. That's okay. Anyway, that's that's why I went with Danny McBride, because... I like the idea of using Danny McBride. I think Danny McBride is a he, good choice, and certainly is a good one-for-one one for the kind of energy that Michael Keaton did. Yeah. Having... <laughs> Having now seen Aladdin, where they went for someone who had kind of the energy of Robin Williams, they went with Will Smith. <laughs> what do you say about someone who would then try to mimic or reproduce the performance that this other person kind of did masterfully instead of kind of like going after their own blend or their own style of craziness? In terms of somebody just bringing back what Michael Keaton did? Yeah. So I think... Part of the problem with going with a one for one, especially on a character as iconic as this, and for Danny McBride, yeah. there's no way Danny McBride does not love this movie. Right, right. Because this movie's great. What do you? How would we get Danny McBride to do Danny McBride's version of Beetlejuice instead of just trying to do an imitation of Michael Keaton's Beetlejuice? Well, that that is really what I was looking at doing is like giving Danny McBride not even not even a script really, not even scripting some of the words and just letting him go as an improviser because he is an incredible improviser. Is he? Oh yeah, I actually don't know how much of an improviser he is. Oh yeah, he is great. He is he is great. And in terms of if you want to get that kind of like really mean spirited Beetlejuice, he's he's great. Beetlejuice doesn't have to be mean-spirited no he doesn't but if he's turning into a demon i mean he he's gonna be uh, he's gonna be quite the handful yeah (laughs) i guess is a nice way of saying it all right fair enough um and danny mcbride certainly is very hot right now i mean righteous gemstones everyone who's watched it has said it is great i've been dying to see it i I know i need to sit down and watch it i just haven't done Um, it yet i love vice principles that's that was a a blast um here's the thing I still think that if it's possible to find someone who is gender non-binary sure. and is able to portray this like insanity, yes. I think that is the ideal situation. I think that's incredibly difficult to find. That said, I think Danny McBride is probably a great choice, and I would love to go with Danny McBride. Okay. On a side note, I do have a friend who works in that community as a production designer, Peaches Christ put up a say that name again peaches christ cool just checking peaches 
Christ. Cool, yeah. Cool, 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 um, cool, 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 cool. She is a, a drag queen in San Francisco. It is a drag scene. Then they put on productions of film, of movies like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, my friend actually got married there. That's amazing. To, uh, during the production of Sheetle Juice. Ah, that's fantastic. Um, where they did a yeah, it was it was spectacular. It it was it was a I would show. Watch that. Yeah, it was fantastic. Every now and then they they bring the production down to Hollywood at the Monteblon. I think last time they did a Troop Beverly Hills. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong on that. It could be. But they are fun shows. Good. They they are really I mean, really fun fantastic. shows. Just on that gender non-binary thing. Yeah. She knocked it out of the park as as Shield Juice. She was just a, a, <laughs> a joy to watch. It, it was a blast. Uh, um, gotta find out if that's on YouTube anywhere. It might be. I don't know. I'll have to. I'll have to do do some deep dive in there. Yeah, interesting. So, anyway, anyway, all right, cool. Yeah, but yeah, with that in mind. So then, moving on from Sheetal Juice, uh, <laughs> who were some of the other smaller characters that you recast? So I did think it would be fun to see some cameos, uh, just because some of these. Performers are still around. Well, no, not just that. We have these performers, but the original characters were cameos as well in in the original Beetlejuice. So I thought I would kind of one for one of that. Great. Like Sylvia Sidney was a was a great horror actress. She played Juno the caseworker. Oh, um, really? Yeah, she was the one who who was Juno the caseworker. Fantastic. So I thought it would be fun to replace her with Helen Mirren, who is just <laughs> kind of could could be a, a great jerk social worker like just <laughs> just doesn't care and smokes through the slit in her throat why and, helen mirren because she's got that really dry brit cool. kind of grit Great. to Love her it. yeah and then the dealings the the new york people that they bring from the city we have maxie dean which was i guess the real estate developer who charles used to work for and was trying to get him to come develop the town yeah thought it'd be kind of fun it was originally played by robert goulet i think i think so i think it was robert goulet it's somebody like robert goulet i will find out okay maxie dean and it is played by robert goulet yeah maxie Um, dean robert goulet so i thought bruce campbell would be a fun oh yeah that'd be that'd be really great addition for him and delia's agent at the time in the in the movie who was also there was played by dick cavett uh-huh uh infamous talk show host so i thought it'd be fun to have conan come on and match his energy and just be dry and mean and you're a flake all right you're great. always a flake <laughs> So th- those were my, like, rounding out in casting. Helen Mirren, Bruce Campbell, I'm fully on board with. Conan O'Brien, you don't think would be a distraction? I think it would be. But, <laughs> but it was just a loose pitch. Uh, here's what I would like. Here's what I would love for this movie. I would love it if it was Conan O'Brien yeah. in a not redhead wig. <laughs> if they if they if put a like, blonde but, wig on him? Or, or black hair. Yeah. Black hair on Conan O'Brien, and he's yeah. like... You'll never amount to anything. Yeah, just totally hamming it up. Yeah, just like... Chewing the scenery, as they I say. Mean, literally, like, the Conan O'Brien logo is his hair. It is. Oh, I know. And Absolutely. I feel like it'd be really funny if we put him in a black wig and no one recognized him. Uh, I think that would be fun. I mean, his, his height kind of gives it thing. away. He's also very, very <laughs> tall. Yeah, yeah. But I thought he would be a fun... I mean, if we're going to have, like, a, a kind of wry talk show host come in and play an agent, he would be the guy. He would absolutely be the he, guy. He, Good he would choice. be the guy. So, I mean, or Samantha B. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, she'd be great, actually. I could totally see her coming in and just chewing just, Delia a new just one. Just ripping Delia you're, apart. You're a flake. You've always been a flake. You always will be a flake. Just that, that <laughs> like, kind of, yeah, let's go with her, man. All She's, right. I didn't, I feel bad that I didn't even consider her. You and the rest of Hollywood. Oh, uh, man. Ouch. I'm going to go lick my Hollywood wounds. All right, uh, great. So now let's talk about writer and director. Okay. Um, also, I'm going to volley real quick to have Danny Elfman do the score again. Great. God, sure. that's incredible. Score. Uh, that's like a big part of the movie. <laughs> Done. Amazing. But yeah, so okay. score Danny Elfman fully on board. That So writer and... So I have separate writer-director. I do have a okay. writing team, but I that's who I've got. So... The writers that I have mm-hmm. wrote Zombieland. Okay. And they wrote Deadpool. Yeah. So they can do the horror comedy and they can also do the manic energy. Okay. They are the writers known as Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick. I see. So that's why I went with it. Because literally those two things, 
Boom. Yeah, uh, I actually agree wholeheartedly with yours. I really, really struggled with who should write this. Um, Directing it, was the tough one for me because you're replacing Tim Burton. Yeah, that was that was strugg- that was tough for me too. Like but, I, I really had to rack my brain. Do you so? Do you have someone for writer? I do, or, or just... I do, but it was kind of like a well, they could do it, but okay. it was it was okay. also having Danny McBride and David Gordon Green as a team. Ah, who, there. yeah, all right. They did they did Halloween, and they also did or the latest Halloween, and they also did Vice Principals together, yeah. which yeah. you know, funny manic energy and horror, but. I, you know, I'm not married to it. I, and don't I think, think I'm, and don't think I'm going to ignore the fact that Walton Goggins was also in Vice Principals. Oh, you shouldn't because okay. that's kind of where I, I yeah, all right, sure, sure, sure. Well. And my um, my brain just caught up to that just now, but whatever. that's okay. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, the the joy of editing is you can you can we'll go put it back no, there no, if you no, want no. to. No, 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 I think it's better if people uh, catch on before me ah. and then are screaming into the void. <laughs> Sam Walton Goggins was also. <laughs> do you not see what he's doing? <laughs> Do you not see the groundwork he's, he's laying? He's just taking guys from Vice Principals. Uh, um, but anyway, okay, so then we'll go with Rhett Reese and Paul Warnick. So yeah. then So then who did you find for director? So the only person I feel like who could... Because let's be honest, the only reason to remake something is to try and do it a little better. Right. The only the only person who leapt to mind that could that could balance a sweet story with comedy and horror in this weird fantasy world was Guillermo del Toro. That makes sense. I can see that. Um, he, he can definitely match that energy and yes, and it if you will. Of course. Um, so that was that was my choice as director. And Guillermo del Toro is a big proponent for practical effects. And Absolutely. I think Guillermo del Toro is probably the right choice. Okay. So I part of the reason why I had a hard time figuring out directors because this is such a child of Tim Burton. He's so yes. stylized and he creates these amazing worlds. Agreed. And so I was trying to come up with other people who are great at creating a fantastical world. And what I realized is even though I don't watch this show, mm-hmm. probably the place to try to probably the well to try to pull from is the well of Doctor Who. Oh, okay. And so I looked up who are some of the well-known directors for Doctor Who because Doctor Who's known for right. practical effects and figuring out situations and creating incredible interesting worlds. Mhm. What I really should have been looking was for the Doctor Who production designer, but... (laughs) Well, we can hire them as production designers. Uh, But the... And I can't believe I didn't... I'm only thinking about that now, but... We need a good production designer. We do. We'll uh, we'll look at that in a second. So the director that I pulled is Toby Haynes, who did Doctor Who, Sherlock, Black Mirror. He did that Brexit movie with with Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, I actually never saw that. Neither did I. But But, like, I'm not, (laughs) I'm familiar with Sherlock. Yes, I I love Sherlock. I feel like Guillermo del Toro is the right choice. Yeah, I I am leaning on that as well. Just because he, he is almost kind of, he's done... So much, I don't want to say he is almost the t- next Tim Burton because that's not fair. That's apples and oranges. But yeah, he's done a lot of. I honestly think Guillermo del Toro is better than. I Tim agree. Burton. I do agree with that. I thoroughly enjoy. I think Guillermo del Toro is a director and Tim Burton's an artist. I agree. So I think that it's different things, and Tim Burton is then rendering his art into film. Guillermo del Toro life. is using film as his art. I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. One hundred percent. And especially if you look at like Shape of Water was was a beautiful beautiful film, and then you have Hellboy two, which is like <laughs> right it's bizarre, weird and crazy, yeah, and amazing, and that's kind of the energy that we Absolutely. need of like yeah, that guy's completely made of gas, you know, or yes, you know, that's that's a fish man. We're gonna play it like it's real, but, it, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the the, the he creature, does love his fish you know. men. Yes, he does. All right, cool. Let's absolutely go with Guillermo del Toro then. So then, I'm sad I didn't think about this now. So the production designer on the original Beetlejuice movie is someone named Bo Welch. Okay. That name actually sounds familiar. Bo Welch, I think, has done a lot of work with... Probably Tim Burton. uh, Tim Burton, because he's also known for Edward Scissorhands. But he also Ah. did Men in Black, A Little Princess, The Cat in the Hat. Oh, boy. (laughs) And so it occurs to me now who I want to be the production designer. So I'm going to see if I can pull them up. And there's a good chance I've used this person before, but I'm just going to see if I can find them. Sure. Oh, (laughs) Men in Black 2. Ah. So the reason I am picking this person is specifically because of their work on Pushing Daisies. Ah, okay. 
And Pushing Daisies is also an incredibly stylized show. Agreed, yes. And in fact, the reason it was canceled is because it was too expensive to make because it was so stylized and wonderful to look at. Yes. And so the production, it's just a single production designer for the entire run of that show. And I'm sure I've used this person before. Okay. But this person also did Men in Black 2. They did Little Britain USA. Most recently, they've been doing Legion. Oh, yeah. All right. And that's what they've been working on. So they also did like Goliath and oh, Agent Carter is so good. Yeah, Legion was pretty Masters incredible Masters of Sex, too. Crazy Ones. Yeah, Agent Carter was, that was a real stylized. Yeah, you know. I loved Agent Carter. So did I. The The name of this person is Michael Wiley. Okay. And Michael Wiley has no image up on IMDb Pro, but that's the name associated with all this production design. So I think we need a production designer, and I feel like it should be Michael Wiley. It should be Michael Wiley, absolutely. With with a, with a list like of credits like that. Most definitely, <laughs> especially with Legion and uh, Pushing Daisies, because man, Pushing, Pushing Daisies, Daisies was... is so good. Yeah, yeah. I I went through and I binged it when I wrote the the one pilot that I had sold. sold. Yeah, <laughs> the one. But man, yeah, it's because it it also had an afterlife tone to it. Absolutely, so. and it's I. Oh, if you look on my shelf, I own both seasons on DVD because yeah. I love this show. Yeah, it was. Oh man, it's fantastic. I, I'm always excited to find new people to show it to, just because it's so stylized and weird, and I love it. Yeah, yeah. It I was... haven't gone back to it in a few years, but I feel like I'm due. Same, same. It's been yeah. it's been almost five since I've seen them all. So, all right. So I think we've got a movie. Let me do a breakdown of who we've got. So, Beetlejuice 2000. Or no, tw- Beetle- 20, 2020. Beetlejuice 2020. <laughs> and it's just Beetlejuice just wearing those googly eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Adam is going to be played by Sam Richardson. Barbara will be Rashida Jones. Jane the Realtor is Molly Shannon. Charles the Dad is Walton Goggins. Delia the Mom is Wendy McLendon Covey. Lydia the Daughter is Maya Check with Otho played by Nathan Lane. Beetlejuice will be played by Danny McBride. Juno the caseworker is Helen Mirren. Maxie Dean is Bruce Campbell. Delia's agent is Samantha B. All of this will be written by Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick. Directed by Guillermo del Toro with score by Danny Elfman and production design by Michael Wiley. <laughs> That's Beetlejuice, the remake. <laughs> Beetlejuice 2020. Beetlejuice 2020. Coming at you never. And the Be- afterlife. Beetlejuice 2020. It's showtime again. <laughs> for the second time uh, oh. go back and watch the original but here we go <laughs> literally in, it should be absolutely that's what'll be on the poster like yeah it, you do better watching the original but hey, hey <laughs> beetlejuice 2 there's still money or beetlejuice 2020 there's still money to be had yeah pretty much beetlejuice 2020 we're out of ideas beetlejuice 2020 let's get ahead of this one on gang <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm I'm out of I'm out of uh, marketing. But would you watch this lines. movie? I would actually watch yeah. this movie. This actually sounds like I think there, this would be fun. Every now and then, there's a remake that comes along that I'm like, I'll oh, check it out. Yeah, this one. Most I recently definitely. picked up a copy of the the Jungle Book remake because I liked the Jungle Book remake. Yeah, yeah. and I thought okay. it was good. I actually didn't see that one, but uh, it will. Now. I liked it because it does its own take. It doesn't try to be the original movie, right? And that's what makes for a good remake instead of just remaking tripe yes Inse- uh, instead of aladdin but yeah so kevin do you want to tell the people where they can follow you and what things you're working on right now and what they have to look forward to from you uh yes actually we've got a if you're going to be in the fabulous state of mississippi in biloxi on halloween our film swipe left will be playing at the fear feet festival award-winning movies oh uh, yes award-winning movie swipe left i i left that part out yes. uh, we'll be playing this halloween and at the fear feet festival in biloxi mississippi i've actually been doing a lot of scores lately cool. starting to get a lot of work as a composer if your movie needs music you can find me at kevin at borderlandcriminal.com that's the email you can send your inquiries to other than that you can find me on instagram at kev most stellar twitter is the same handle but i'm barely on there uh, it's uh, th- this uh th- the last four years of politics has, has driven me quite far away from twitter <laughs> so i can see that yeah but that's that's what i've been doing doing a lot of scores great so that's kind of become my passion yeah, actually that's great so yeah if you're looking for for music for a movie that's where you can find me. And he's very good. You should reach out to him. Thank you. If you're interested in finding out more about me, I'm at Sam Gash, S-A-M-G-A-S-C-H on Twitter. 
If you want to follow the podcast, it is at Ideal Remake on both Twitter and Instagram, or join us on Facebook, Ideal Remake or Ideal Remake Podcast. That's where stuff gets posted. Or if you could leave us a five-star review on Apple iTunes, or not Apple iTunes, Apple Podcasts, because it's not iTunes anymore, Apple Podcasts, I would really appreciate that because it turns out those do matter, and I also would like to matter. (laughs) Sam <laughs> struggle in life to matter. I think that's it for Beetlejuice. For Beetlejuice, yeah. So then, Beetlejuice this, 2020. Beetlejuice 2020. So then, what's your favorite quote from the movie Beetlejuice? Nice fucking model. Nice fucking model. Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs>